thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to host uh, Anne-Marie Lemire. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, I want to also acknowledge the presence of Carmen Febles, who is one of the writers for the book of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, Our Women and Vision. I'd like to introduce Anne-Marie Lemire, who received her PhD in art history from the University of Texas in Austin, at Austin with a specialization of contemporary Chicano X Latinx art. She currently serves as professor of art for the Juanita and Ralph Harvey School of Visual Arts at Midwestern University, State University in Wichita Falls, Texas. Her published work has appeared in, this, in several journals, among them is After Image, Chicana Latina Studies, the Journal of Latino, Latin American Studies and Religion and the Arts, and in the books Beyond Heritage, Border Crossings, Chicana Critical Perspectives and Praxis, New Frontiers in Latin American Borderlands, Latinx Artists of Texas, Voices in Concert in the Spirit of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, and Los Maestros, Early Explorers of Chicano Identity. She has created several exhibitions of Chicano, Chicanx art, including Adelante, Siempre, recent work by Southern California Chicana photographers, Chicano photographer the 1970s from a Chicano perspective, and Globe, I guess it's Arizona, right? AX, a community at the crossroads. Layer serves on the National Advisory Board for Mexican American Arts since 1848, a research initiative inaugurated by Karen Marie Davalos and Constance Cortez in 2016, which holds a searchable digital platform and will produce a multi-volume book, Adjacent Imaginaries. And more importantly, she's a co-editor with Dr. Laura E. Perez of the anthology Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, Art, Women, Vision, published recently by Duke University Press. We're so excited to have you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much for coming, driving from Fort Worth and being here with us today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, Patricia. I, I wanted to just do a tiny bit of housekeeping at the beginning because many of us forget to silence our cell phones and our smartwatches. So if you haven't already done that, please take a moment. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Patricia for this amazing opportunity to present to you the work uh, that has been a labor of love with Dr. Perez and myself for the last five years. And uh, Laura will not be able to be with us today. She had prior, uh, previous research commitments that uh, are, so we're channeling her spirit. So she's with us in spirit, if not in body today. And uh, two other things that I wanted to acknowledge uh, as we begin to unpack the book a little bit for all of you, and that is that we received the Wyeth Foundation for American Art Publication Fund of the College Art Association and uh, my home institution, Midwestern State University, known as MSU Texas, and a project grant from UC Berkeley. All of these three funding sources um, allowed us and supported the full color illustrations that you see in this particular anthology. So we want to acknowledge our, our funding sources. And it, it really made a magnificent difference, I think, to the quality of the book to have so much of Consuelo's work available to the public in, in full color illustration. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So what I would like to do today is to read certain sections of the anthology and to orient you to it uh, initially. So the first thing that I'm going to do is read from the introduction. And the introduction, it consists of three parts. It was a part that was written solely by Dr. Perez, a section that was written solely by myself, and then we collaborated and wrote together the third section. So I'm going to start there because it talks a little bit about how we conceived the structure of the text. This anthology is organized in three sections. As in weaving, we first had to select the thread in a creative but preparatory production stage. In our anthology, a small group of essays serves an analogous function in part one, spinning, making thread. A preface by renowned Chicano writer and filmmaker Luis Valdez opens the section. It is followed by essays by Carol Sauvignon and Christine Laffer. In part two, weaving, handwork, 
essays developed for exhibition catalogs and for art historical and interdisciplinary visual cultural studies scholarship. Look closely at Jimenez Underwood's work. The bulk of the anthology's essays are here, written by Constance Cortez, Amalia Mesa Baines, Laura E. Perez, Maria Esther Fernandez, Emily Zayden, Clara Roman Orio, Anne Marie Limer, Karen Mary Davalos, Christine Serna, Carmen Fevelis, who's with us today, and Janelle Navarro. Part three, Off the Loom Into the World, examines Jimenez Underwood's effects as a teacher in her own and others' classrooms and through her public lectures. It includes essays by Robert Milnes and Marcos Pizarro and a poem by prize-winning poet Veronica Reyes that closes the anthology. So that's the basic structure in this, this three-part approach that we took uh, using weaving and thread as a way to structure and analyze the anthology. Now what I would like to do is read another section of the co-authored part of the introduction that talks a little bit about the placement of Consuelo's work. The authors in this anthology demonstrate the multiple contributions that the work of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood makes to various fields of study, such as art history, cultural studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, history, religious studies, visual cultural studies, and women of color feminisms. Deploying analyses rooted in feminist intersectional and simultaneity of oppressions approaches, examining the complex imbrications of racialization, gender, class, and histories of imperialism, the anthology's contributors are attentive to the specificities of the artist's historical and cultural moment, the conditions of Jimenez Underwood's childhood, and her career through the present. They are mindful of what it meant for the artist to be raised on the border as a child of a Mexican-American mother and an undocumented immigrant Mexican Huichol father, of her family's labor and her own childhood labor in the fields of California, and of her tremendous compassion for those who are cruelly targeted today by anti-immigrant sentiment and her concern for the environmental fate of our planet. From this engagement with her time and our, with her and our time and place, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood makes a particularly unique and socially urgent contribution to the histories of art and visual culture. Many artists have produced bodies of work that elicit a sense of awe because of their technical mastery. They intrigue us with their conceptual depth and breadth. They move us deeply with the sheer power of their aesthetic beauty and prompt us to action by giving us a deeper understanding of the toxic effects of dominant power structures through the construction of compelling and incisive social critiques. Rarely, however, do we encounter work that accomplishes all these tasks while also exploding the established boundaries of art media and blurring disciplinary boundaries of visual art forms, such as installation, performance, sculpture, fiber, murals, public art, and community-engaged, socially conscious art. And Consuelo's work does all of this. In many ways, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood defies strict art historical classification, precisely because she repeatedly uses a complex confluence of media and multiple art forms in her work. Now I would like to take you to the section, and I'll read just brief parts of the section that, of the introduction that Dr. Perez wrote. So this is her writing voice. I first became aware of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood through her altar installation, Alba, from 1997, a strikingly poetic artwork that featured a wire mesh cone that climbed 32 feet toward the ceiling of San Francisco's Mexican Museum. Its base was at the center of a six-foot crescent moon, traced on the gallery floor with small white stones. Ears of corn and other objects lay in a small heap at the center. The piece seemed to render visible the correspondences activated in spiritual offerings. 
casting those connections in the language of the net, a weaving of threads and air, of the material and the immaterial, in short, of heaven and earth. The title, Alba, or Dawn, captured the liminal through the crepuscular, when night and day are simultaneously present. Grounding the moon as the base of the piece lent it to further musings about the relationship of the moon to planetary life, to the earth, to the human, and pointed to what is above and beyond the moon in the cosmos. The verticality of the wire netting proffered a rendition of the proverbial spiritual ladder. This encounter still fills me with wonder, and I remember even now the feeling that it invoked in me. I could see the artist's hand in the making and feel her own reverence before what she invoked and to which she paid homage. This was more than 20 years ago, in 1997. Sometime later, I began corresponding with the artist. I visited her Cupertino, California home and her studio in Walala to interview her and enjoyed hours studying slides of her work, newspaper reviews, and a few curatorial exhibition catalogs. I wrote about some of her work of that period, including Sacred Jump and the Land Grab series in a book on Chicana feminist art and spirituality. In the decade that followed, I came to know Consuelo, her family, and her work better as she began preparing for her 2009 retirement. And her work, and her work better as, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, her retirement from teaching, and as she started to develop more or less simultaneously several new series that she anticipated would occupy the coming decade, 2009 to 2019, as indeed it did. We continue to work closely. Consuelo's often poetic experimental work, the product of an artist who masters weaving, is also the medium of some of the most serious work of our decade, from which she lays bare the less pleasant landscape of our time and place. California's entrenched anti-Mexicanism, crafted across more than 150 years following the U.S.-Mexican War of 1846 to 1848, and beneath this, the anti-Indigenous and anti-African-American racism that rationalized Eurocentric colonial settler occupation of the indigenous Americas, warfare against Mexico and Spain, and the annexation of their territories, and slavery are not off the hook in Consuelo's work, nor, most importantly, is their legacy today found in the inhumane and dehumanizing racial profiling of, criminalization of, violence against, and ongoing social, economic, political, and cultural marginalization of people of color and our cultures. Indeed, early on, metallic wire and barbed wire, signatures of her work, grid, sever, cross, tear, and hide within the folds of beautiful woven pieces. Against this era of historically disproportionate enrichment and pauperization, against the hardening of the heart that does not see homelessness, poverty, immigration due to war, and economic crises as our problems against the ethical and moral confusion of patriarchal bias, of Eurocentric racism, of classism, and of a human centrism that has already destroyed a great deal of our planetary commons, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood grows her strangely beautiful hybrids. Crossing painting, silkscreen, installation, and murals with spinning, weaving, sewing, and embroidery, she creates things that seem impossible, like a tree that envelops the barbed wire that once fenced it, and flowers that push their way up through the pavement. In 2013, Maria Esther Fernandez curated a one-woman exhibition of Consuelo's work at the Trite Museum in Santa Clara, California. It was something of a respect retrospective that brought together older work with pieces from her newer series. 
After years of talking about how good it would be to write extensively about Consuelo's work and publish images of it in book form, it finally happened after that exhibition. In late 2014, I sent invitations to various people, some of whom Consuelo had named. Uh, she had worked with them over the years and felt that they understood her work. Some of whom were scholars I had heard or read who have written about her work or other artists. We eventually included a poet whose wonderful poem joins the, uh, joins the assembly gathered here. Others wanted to co-edit or write, but their prior commitments did not permit this. Anne-Marie Leimer, who had been missing all along, joined me as co-editor midway through our project. In the end, Consuelo's allegiance is not to a nation or even to a people, but to our environmentally imperiled planet. The indigenous philosophies or worldviews that she draws upon, those of her own family, of Huichol, of her husband's ancestral Yaqui, that through marriage is also her own, of the Mesoamerican core of common indigenous beliefs reflected in Maya and Nahua spiritual and philosophical beliefs, become as religions and philosophies hope to be, useful perspectives from which to heal the human-made social infirmities that allow sexism, racism, classism, and the like. These indigenous philosophies decenter an irresponsible narrow human awareness into a more responsible, modest, accurate understanding of ourselves as a mere, if crucial, part of an interdependent planet. Her work as a whole suggests we matter not more nor less than other life forms. Our authors here help us to follow her in this pilgrimage toward the wisdom that characterizes her art, her love of thread and weaving, her vision. Now I'd like to read a, a short section of the introduction that I wrote. I first learned about the art of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood in May 2010 when I received an announcement for the group exhibition Chicana Spiritual Reflections, which was advertised as the initial show in an exhibition series titled Bay Area Chicana, sponsored by the Castellano Family Foundation. I had lived in the Bay Area for 15 years before attending graduate school in Texas, and I welcomed any opportunity to return home especially because my interest in Chicanx had been, Chicanx art had been fostered at San Francisco's Galleria de la Raza and the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts, as well as San Jose's Movimiento de Arte y Cultura Latino-Americana, also known as MACLA, and through frequent exposure to the plethora of murals throughout San Francisco's Mission District. Because my research interests often focused on the intersections of Chicana art and spirituality, I resolved to see the show as soon as the semester concluded. One day in early June, I boarded a plane to San Jose, took a cab from the airport to the Triton Museum in Santa Clara, interviewed the show's curator, Maria Esther Fernandez, extensively photo documented the artworks for the rest of the day, and flew back to Southern California that evening. The extraordinary work I encountered that day, especially undocumented border flowers from 2010, has inspired many research presentations. When I entered the central exhibition room at the Triton, I encountered undocumented border flowers which consumed an entire wall of the museum and composed the second work in Jimenez Underwood's ongoing Borderlines series. I was immediately struck by the combination of installation, mural, sculpture, and painted and sewn textiles, and felt a sense of commemoration and incantatory petition, similar to a home altar. Having studied and exhibited sculpture in the Bay Area before graduate school, I was completely taken with the three-dimensional qualities of her installation. The found and fabricated objects that compose the power wands, or place markers that indicated twin border cities, such as Calexico, California, and Mexicali, Baja, California, 
the 10 gorgeous larger than life-sized flowers representing the specific border states, and the tiny three-dimensional votive image of the Virgin of Guadalupe that Jimenez Underwood inserted amid red, red barbed wire pierced by gold and silver nails that marked the El Paso Ciudad Juarez border. I had once laboriously woven various colors of ribbon into the diagonal openings of a punishing and inflexible wire mesh to fashion a garment honoring a particular individual. But this, this was weaving, sewing, and paying tribute to all sentient beings on a grand and unimaginable scale. I became a co-editor of this anthology in March 2017 at the invitation of Laura E. Perez. The following spring, I traveled to the Bay Area where I first met Consuelo Jimenez Underwood and experienced the, art work, the artist at work on her loom, weaving what would later become, for you and me, one of a trio of works celebrating uh, the folk musician Woody Guthrie. During that visit, she showed me a range of works from the earliest surviving examples of her embroidery on family clothing to her first intentionally wearable rebozo, which measures more than eight feet long and graces the wall above her living room window to her first delicate tapestries with their infinitesimal warp and weft threads and which contained select sections in which the artist used silver metallic thread to produce distinct patterns, a harbinger of greater things to come. The way Jimenez Underwood uses fiber is revelatory. Thread becomes not just a tool for suturing together disparate parts, but one for drawing in space and in time. It becomes line, becomes texture, becomes energy pulsating with life. In her hands, thread has a life of its own. It critiques and cajoles. It provokes and prognosticates. It rages and repairs. In the artist's statement that accompanied the Chicana Spiritual Reflections exhibition, Jimenez Underwood expressed a hope that her work would induce her audience to recognize the threads that bind us. My co-editor, our authors, and I have woven together an anthology that demonstrates the profound contribution that the work of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood makes to the histories of art and to our world. Let us, like the artist, initiate the process of healing and transformation our planet so dearly needs and begin with the threads that connect us steadfastly and irrefutably to each other. So Patricia, I'm about, we're about at 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly read a little bit more, but do you think this would be a, a moment to end? I think it was a very good moment to see if we have any questions from the public, from the audience. Can you go over this March work that's in the background in the Absolutely. Well, uh, one of the things that we write about in the anthology is not only the depth and breadth, but also the scope of her work. So if you go down this area, you'll see these absolutely teeny tiny uh, tapestries. And that was one of the things that she began to do um, as a part of her graduate studies work. And then of course you can see how the, those initial engagement with thread and fiber and weaving has jumped off the loom, right? Those are some of the things that we organized the anthology to address. But this particular one uh, brings together about three or four major material or media themes that we see repeatedly in Consuelo Jimenez Underwood's work. And that would be the, the repetition of the caution sign. And so in a number of publications on Consuelo, I trace the, the development of the caution sign, which happened in the 1980s. And interestingly enough, it was a Navajo 
man, a graphic artist, who was hired by the Department of Transportation in California to design this particular sign. And when you watch Consuelo's uh, interviews or her videos that have been made of her, she talks about how painful and how angry she is when she has encountered this sign because she, I think the quote is, they're thinking of us as animals. Right? So that the, the fleeing family, the father, the mother, and the child are uh, crossing the border and then going in and out of traffic. And so many people were being killed at that time in the 80s in California and other places. And so the intention of the Department of Transportation was to prevent those deaths. Um, so it's something that you see in large scale here, but also it's repeated as a stamp or, or a silkscreen in many of her other works. And also the humble safety pin is something that Consuelo absolutely triumphs because she says, well, you know, in, in modern day times, we don't have time to fix the hem of our skirt, right? We just use a safety pin. And I think, I think there's so many ways that we could address the idea of the pin because it is something that's humble and quotidian and yet she elevates it to something that is incredibly aesthetic. So this idea of connection is part of the, the idea of the pin, but I also think the idea of perforation and piercing is a part of sort of the nuance or the symbolic understanding of the pin. Um, because she's, again, she's trying to repair damage of the earth and of people uh, and of migrant and immigrant communities and by, by putting all of these, um, these small pieces of fabric um, together. And uh, there's a particular, there are particularly two parts that I love of this. I saw this for the first time in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at one of her um, exhibitions where she did a borderlines installation. And she was working with the community there to trace the uh, migratory patterns of people and also the, the area of how the border affected people in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, this area is one that I particularly like because you can see she's taken this one and then a little bit up and to the left. These are pieces of, of, of jeans, right, that we wear all the time. And this idea of taking something that is ordinary and holding it up as something that has spiritual and aesthetic power is very much a part of Consuelo's work. Um, and this, the title of this one is See Jane Run. And so there are, there's a couple of other ways that her titles refer to Dick and Jane in reading in early childhood. So this is one of the pieces that uh, relates to that particular, that nuance that we have of how did we first read? We read the stories of Dick and Jane. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to to talk about them. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where this is so monumental, or nearly monumental, in comparison with the very delicate um, tapestries mm -hmm. that we see. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what I could do? This is part yes, of I'm my chapter. I was going to ask you about <laughs> these ones. You can yeah. talk about it. That maybe, there's a, there, maybe there's a section. I, I was, wasn't sure if this one had made it on time. Yes. Uh, to, because I know that the official opening, and I hope you'll come back next week for the official opening of the exhibition. But this is part of a three-part series. And so uh, my co-editor, Laura, was very attenuated and attuned to what do we need to place in the book, right? So we, we work on the flag series. Carmen Feblis and Janelle Navarro write on the Reboso series. Um, other people treat the flags and this work, the work that you see directly over here, uh, was done so recently it, it's not in the exhibition uh, or it's not in this particular book. So we're, we're hoping that future scholars will be publishing more work on that. So I thought maybe what I could do is just kind of give you a very brief introduction to the triptych and my chapter and then uh, a little bit of, on this particular work. So my chapter is chapter nine in the anthology, and it's titled Garments for the Goddess of the Americas, the American Dress Triptych. And I'll try to keep this shortened to the point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to take something that you've worked on. Uh, there are so many threads in this particular uh, 
chapter, right? I'm talking about how the dress form has been used in Chicana and Chicano art. Um, I'm talking about the use of Mesoamerican imagery in Chicana art um, as, and a number of other spiritual practices that find their way and shape the content of Chicana art as well. As early as 2007, art historical criticism generated by leading Chicanx scholar Constance Cortez places the work of fiber artist Consuelo Jimenez Underwood firmly under the theoretical umbrella of the post-colonial. In her essay, Cortez refers to Jimenez Underwood's work as topographies, a term used to describe the three-dimensionality of the artist's wall hangings and installations. Topographical maps refer to two-dimensional drawings that use lines or blocks of color to indicate the shape of distinct physical features, the elevation or depression of natural phenomena, such as lakes, mountains, and canyons, the presence of rainfall or its lack. Summarizing the overall nature of the artist's work, Cortez explains that the textile becomes a map through which we travel, and that the artist provides viewers with personal, a personal cartographic journey through which they can view with clarity the impact of real and imagined lines of demarcation. This visualized journey is nowhere more evident than in the artworks examined in this study, American Dress, Virgin de Chocolat, and American Dress, Virgin de Tepin, Chile, both from 1999, and Undocumented Nopal, 2525 AD, which you see over here on the wall, which contain Jimenez Underwood's signature elements, visual depictions of specific geographic areas, map-making conventions such as parallels and meridians, delicately fashioned grid lines and silk screened images of deities such as the Virgin of Guadalupe and the Mexica Earth Goddess, Cuatlique, and yet compose a unique place in the artist's production, both in form and in function. Using the lens of the spiritual, this study locates Tepin, Chacolat, and Nopal within multiple worldviews and spiritual traditions where clothing acts as a ritual or healing object, provides a close examination of the Mesoamerican figure of Cuatlique and her role within the American Dress series and investigates the multivalent symbolic meanings of Chile, Cacao, and Nopal. So I'm going to summarize a little bit of this and then maybe get to the, the description here of the work, the third work. So she began this work uh, in the late 1990s. She had gone to Spain uh, on an ex for an exhibition and a gallery work. And folks there were, were trying to place her, like, who are you? What are your roots? And she said, uh, I'll, I'll use her quote, she said, when, when she replied, Californian, Mexican, American, they responded with laughter and said, Americana, Americana, emphasizing her nationality over ethnicity or regional affiliation. And she thought to herself, darn right, for I come from the land of Chile, chocolate, and Nopales. When Jimenez Underwood returned to the United States, the concept for the triptych took shape. And so she begins to think about what are the fragments that we have of textiles from pre-contact times. And most of them because of the kinds of uh, landscapes and climate conditions, we have just very small pieces of these textiles. And so she said that what she wanted to do was just suggest a part of a dress, and that dress also was part of a, a map, so it was a fragment of the dress. Um, although all three works resemble dresses, they are in fact wall hangings that have more in common with the quilted and embroidered fabric of border flowers flag and the grid demarcation of sacred jump. Initially, the viewer reads these works more as garments than as flat wall hangings because of their ampere or high-waisted silhouettes. And that's true for the first two, uh, Ver uh, Vergine de Te uh, Tepin and Vergine de Chocolat, uh, because it's, it's ruffled and ruched at the top, and she's inserting red barbed wire in the silk red velvet fabric that she's using to create these wall hangings. Um, and of course, the work that you see here was done 20 years later as the third part in the triptych. 
In another gesture toward identity construction, Tepin, Chocolat, and Nopal acknowledge and celebrate three of the artist's favorite foods, chile, chocolate, and cactus, all indigenous to the Americas, like the artist. And then I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the, the importance of these foodstuffs, because they are food, but they are more than food, especially uh, in the work of Consuelo. The word tepin in the title refers to chiltepin, or chiltepec in Nahuatl, the indigenous language of central Mexico. Uh, and tepin is a small, round, red, intensely hot fruit that gives Jimenez Underwood great delight. Her passion for the heat and spice of Chile endures, and the respect she has for this indigenous plant shaped her wish to celebrate the eating of Chile in the Americas. Similarly, in Nepal, the work that you see here, the artist celebrates a lifelong relationship with the Nepal, the prickly pear cactus, or opuntia. Her intention in making this work was to give thanks to the plant for its life-sustaining, nutritive, and healing powers, as well as its function as a mordant or fixative for natural dying. Whereas the artist views chile as the fire that cooks the food and chocolate as a treat, she understands nopal fundamentally as an always available food source, stating that it often was the only thing we had in the house and that I would not be here if not for this food. Her intention then in Nepal is to reflect a relationship between the plant and me, to give honor to the food and to her ancestors for developing this incredible plant which grows anywhere and can, which, which can provide so much. The plant then symbolizes physical survival and daily sustenance that create the very fiber of human life and allow for its continuity. Uh, then just in terms of characterizing the entire triptych, I'll read just a couple of things and then I'll, I'll read a little bit of the description of how she began to work on this particular work. Tepin, Chocolat, and Nopal constitute a sharp deviation from much of Jimenez Underwood's art production because they are not woven but rather hand-sewn. This is what is so extraordinary about these works that you see. They're completely hand-sewn. Every stitch was not done by machine. Uh, and then she embellished them with buttons, barbed and copper wire, silk screened images, and gold metallic thread. Uh, and then what I'm not really telling you yet is you can see some of the demarcations in the work around here with the, the meridians, uh, the vertical and horizontal, the latitude and the longitude lines. And those are so, still present here in Nepal, but they're very present in the earlier two works of the triptych. A small interruption. Sure. We're very excited that, that we're going to be showcasing the, the, uh, the tepin in New York City. So you all have to come, come to, to, New York City. to the gallery in New York to see the dress of Chile. Let's see. Okay, so probably just one other point that I wanted to make. Because I want you to understand a little bit more. Not all of you may be familiar with Mesoamerican deities, Mesoamerican worldviews. So the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe and the image of Cuatlicue, who is a Mexica, um, Aztec is the more commonly misnomer used that's to discuss the uh, indigenous people's pre-contact of central Mexico. But I wanted to characterize a little bit about for you who this deity is and why she is so important in um, Consuelo's work. Because this idea of mother and mothering, uh, not only the earth but uh, of people, is a, is a thread throughout the chapter but also throughout Consuelo's work. As Earth Mother, Cuatlicue represents the duality of life and death in complementary opposition. And considering that she is the mother of more than 400 children, it is no wonder that she is also understood as a symbol of fertility and one who bestows fertility. In her role as mother, she can be seen as our mother, the mother of the people. Another key aspect of Cuatlicue that helps us think about Jimenez Underwood's use of this image in American dress 
is that Kwatlikwe, as Earth Goddess, is the mother of Huitzilopochtli, the Mexica's patron deity. Huitzilopochtli, in his role as patron deity, also instigates the great migration of the Mexica, which takes about 200 years, from their paradise island home of Atzalan to the new capital, Tenochtitlan, which is now contemporary Mexico City, which I find an apt symbolic reference to the themes of migration and border crossing in, our, in the work of Jimenez Underwood. What could be a more appropriate parallel to the experiences of contemporary border crossers than the journey fraught with danger, deprivation, humiliation, family separation, and enslavement suffered by the Mexica. So they leave Aslan and for 200 years their patron deity, Huitzilopochtli, urges them on to found a new capital. And so if you're familiar with the iconography of the Mexican flag, you know that there is a cactus on a rock and there is e an eagle often with a snake in its mouth. And we see the Pochli said to the Mexica, there are eight groups that leave Aslan and seven, which after 200 years of, of pilgrimage, finally found Tenochtitlan. The deity, we see the Pochli says to them, where you found your new capital will be this place where you see an eagle on top of a cactus on top of a rock. And so, not surprisingly, the word Mexica, Mexico, et cetera, um, and that iconography is in the Mexican flag. And let's see. I think the last part that I wanted to read, so hopefully that characterizes the triptych a little bit for you. Um, and it was something that, uh, that I mentioned, I didn't quite finish my thought earlier, but Laura commissioned me to write this. I was focusing on some other things uh, in the initial uh, work that I wanted to include in the anthology, and she said, you know, Anne, there's a section that's missing. Uh, and we were trying to represent as much as possible the breadth of Consuelo's work, and so she asked me to do this work, uh, which I was very excited to do. The works examined in this essay celebrate indigenous foodstuffs plants native to the Americas, and when the artist elevates Chile, chocolate, and Nepal to the level of the sacred, these plants, in all their mundane and symbolic power, become aspects of the goddess of the Americas. Their continued existence testifies to a world before European contact and exploitation, recalls the extraordinary contributions and traditional knowledge systems of pre-contact American civilizations, reveals their multivalent functions as symbolic, quotidian, and gustatory, and reminds us that life is pain and pleasure, spicy and sweet. Jimenez Underwood uses a titular and formal allusion to the dress that equates the sacred female body with the earth and with earth as mother, indigenous virgin, goddess, and divine power. Therefore, the works constitute an offering to the sacred feminine, to the goddess of the Americas, and to the indigenous bodies that have endured. Significantly, Jimenez Underwood embeds in the artworks a pressing petition for the health and preservation of the planet and an ominous warning to those who ignore the urgency of this plea. I use the careful, oh no, I see, the careful intentional process of making these works by hand as an act of love, an act of spiritual devotion to Mother Earth, and as a call of action to honor and protect her. Understood within these contexts, the American dress triptych can certainly be seen as Jimenez Underwood intended, as a statement of deep, profound, and prideful American indigenous identity, and as garments that join the lineage of sacred clothing infused with power by the intentional, painstaking labor of the maker. And that, that concludes, that's the concluding paragraph that's of my chapter. That's so great. Thank you, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone we have the book for sale and we have Anne-Marie to do some book signing. Thank you. And I appreciate your coming today. Thank you very much.
so many stickies. <laughs> I know that, that that's so good. It reminds us of my taste. <laughs> I had to practice no, that's like good. moving from oh, yeah, I put no, like one good. through four, yeah, right? Thank you, thank you. Oh, it was wonderful to stand up and talk about that piece. Yeah. Hey, David. Hi. Hi. That'll be $25, please. Okay. <laughs> Do you know Patricia? No, I don't. Oh, my goodness. Hi, David Montejano. Nice to meet you, Patricia Rosili. David, what? Montejano. 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 Nice to meet you. So he must have been gone from UT. He was a prof at UT Austin. Uh, and then went to UC Berkeley, but it must have been right before you came. Yes, Patricia exactly. is also a PhD in art history from UT Austin. UT Austin. Oh, really? And was worked with Jacqueline Barnes just the last, before the last she oh, died. Oh, really? yes. oh, my God. I was lucky enough to get her on the, her last class. Uh huh. Yeah. You were there when Mari Carmen was there? No. 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 no I got there much later, like 2000. Uh, 13, uh -huh. 2011, I don't remember now. But I got my PhD in 2017. <laughs> okay, I left in 2002. I, I oh, that's the early. Yeah. Uh, I remember the Malagamba just has left when I when I got it. Okay, yeah. Amalia. Um, yeah, Amalia, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a graduate student when I was there. Wow. So uh, what did you used to talk? Uh, I was a uh, professor in the history department. Oh, the history department. Okay. Yeah, the okay. and, oh. and then I went to Berkeley, and I just apenas volví a Ah, mira que bien. Pues por favor, if you want to add your name and email to the guest book, sure. so you can get to our uh, yeah, you know, notices. Sure. Uh, we have Consuelo's opening on Wednesday. She's going to be here. Oh. Please join us. Okay. Six to eight. Okay. Wednesday. Yeah. Patricia, I did not bring change. We can, oh, right now. So okay. we owe him $15. $15. Do we have any, you have any change? <laughs> One thing oh, we forgot to organize. I got a dollar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you get it? Yes, or you don't take cards, right? You don't take cards, right? No, the lady can go today. Today, oh, it's perfect. Yeah, we get to hang out with you a little bit oh, longer. Okay. okay. Where do I sign up? Oh, right over there. Oh, There's yes. a, a guest book. Oh, yes.